So as we continue our discussion on DC Rebirth, what I want to do here is pick up with Detective Comics. Now, I know I'm a little bit behind here. I know that, um, you know, this story has largely been covered by almost everybody simply because it's a Batman title. And that usually happens. You know, whenever DC releases, you know, a reboot or a refresh of their continuity, Batman and Superman are usually always the first two to be targeted uh, just because they're, you know, for the most part, the two most popular superheroes that two have ever existed in the history of comic books. But for me, Detective Comics really highlights the great aspects, the great greatest aspects of the uh, of the DC Rebirth event. And what I mean here is, you know, DC Rebirth uh, is designed to take what worked with the New 52 and combine it with what worked in the pre-New 52 continuity to create something wholly new, right? It's designed to grab us as the reader, to take the things we love and to bring it together into one cohesive continuity. Now, Detective Comics actually focuses or initially opens up with the with Batman, or I guess with the character of Azrael. Now, in DC Comics, Azrael is actually kind of a mixed bag when it comes to fanfare. There are some who love him, there are some that don't really care for him, uh, but it's undoubtable that he is a well-known name in DC Comics circles, regardless of which circle you come from. But the fact remains here that Azrael took the place of Bruce Wayne, or I guess his Batman, uh, you know, following Bruce Wayne's uh, back being broken by Bane during the Nightfall, or, uh, Nightfall story arc in the early 1990s. But the issue with this is that following this particular storyline, uh, you know, Azrael never really seemed to quite gain the same kind of fame he had before. Uh, you know, going from taking the role of Batman to being relegated to being an assassin, you know, and that kind of thing just didn't really resonate with readers. And so the problem was that uh, Jean Paul Valley basically kind of disappeared from the DC landscape. You know, in the beginning, shortly after Nighthall, he wasn't really out of the game, but he was certainly being handed his hat. And it got to the point where he was just pushed out of the game in its entirety. Now, it remained this way in DC Comics, even going into the New 52, uh, until we saw Batman and Robin Eternal. And that was when um, when Jean Paul Valley made his return. Now, this was actually kind of cool because what Scott Snyder did here is he basically took the element of Jean Paul Valley and he largely kept it the same, simply because the version that appeared during Nightfall and shortly after was the one that everybody was the most familiar with. And so it made sense, you know, to, to take that version and to roll him over and give people the one they're familiar with. And then if changes were going to be made, make those changes shortly thereafter. Uh, the issue with this is that again, you know, John Paul Valley just sort of stayed behind. I mean, he wasn't a great big, huge character. He was one of many faces that appeared in the, uh, in the eternal line of stories. And so what happens here with DC Rebirth is we see a lot of the same thing that we've seen before. You know, John Paul Valley is still operating as an assassin for St. Dumas. You know, he still has a handler, so on and so forth, but he's really more of a catalyst in this story, which is kind of the, the role that he prominently plays. He, he's basically a way for writers to set up future events that are going to be coming. And this is exactly what happens with uh, with Jean-Paul Valley. You know, of course, uh, he's dealing with Batman. Batman's, you know, facing off against him and so on. But in the midst of their conversation, in the midst of their of their conflict, uh, somebody's watching the two of them. Now, we don't really know who this person is off the top of their head, which, of course, we'll find out later on. But at the same time, while Batman is trying to subdue Jean-Paul uh, Jean Valley, ultimately, uh, Jean-Paul Valley is in Capacitated. And when Batman deduces where it came from, he realizes that it's a drone. Now, we'll follow this line of thought to its completion here in a little while, but what we do is we actually transfer over to Batwoman herself. Now, this is one of the things I love the most about Detective Comics, because this is the new 52 Batwoman. You know, this is not the pre-new 52 version. So this version hails from a military family. She spent time in the military. She was uh, not really a person who led a unit per se, so much as she was someone that knew how to work as a team, which will be a major focal point, you know, for the, the story of Detective Comics. But the fact remains here that she's in a conversation with what appears to be her father. And her father says that basically she's she's taken the wrong direction here. Now, something to point out here is that uh, is that Batwoman was never officially part of the Bat family. She was, but she wasn't. She was part of the Bat family in terms of her name, but she was actually offered a position by Bruce Wayne as part of Batman Incorporated, which was Bruce's attempt to kind of make like an international Bat force, so to speak. And uh, she turned that, that offer down. And the result was that she basically kind of operated as a vigilante on her own, dealing with criminals and various characters that would normally go unnoticed or, you know, without without being uh, taken care of by the traditional Bat family of Batgirl and Batman and, you know, Robin and so on and so forth. And so the conversation she has with her father here uh, gives us some insight. What he basically says is that Batwoman was in a position when she was in the U.S. military to continue her training to the point where she would have led a unit and quite possibly progressed up the ranks, especially considering the fact that her father was in the military. Uh, the issue with this is that because she chose to go off and become a vigilante, uh, ultimately she seems to have turned her back or her father feels 
feels as though she turned her back on everything her family stood for. And so the result is that, you know, with the two of them uh, more or less arguing or, or failing to see, you know, each other's views, uh, what we're given here is this perspective that, you know, Batwoman does not see eye to eye with her father. There's, there really doesn't seem to be any love lost between the two of them. And so once they hang up, she's immediately met by the arrival of Batman. Now, this is why I say Batwoman was never officially part of the Bat family. You know, Kathy Kane was never part of the Bat family as we would view it. The whole basis behind this is that during Bruce Wayne or during Batman's conversation with her, he basically says, you know, he kind of gives a rundown of Jean-Paul Valley, really for us as the reader, for those of us who weren't familiar with his character, but that while Batman had, you know, been trying to, uh, more, at least it seemed to be, trying to get Jean-Paul Valley to his side, uh, in the end, you know, Jean-Paul Valley chose not to see things that way, but was incapacitated by an unseen force, after which Batman deduced that a drone had been initiated, which had launched a strike against Azrael, and when Batman tracked down the drone, he hacked into its circuit, uh, circuitry and realized it was basically part of a swarm. Now, the reason why I brought this information to uh, to Batwoman was because of the fact that she was part of the military. More so than that, she has access to military-grade technology and various forms of technology that Bruce Wayne might not have access to due to the fact that he's basically a civilian, whereas, you know, Batwoman spent time at a, as a citizen. And so the issue here is that Batman's, you know, this technology, this drone, is about 10 years ahead of current technology that exists out there right now. Now, we're not told explicitly if this is uh, technology as a whole in terms of, you know, in the world as it exists right now, or if it's simply military technology. But a general rule of thumb is that when the general public is able to gain access to a form of technology, the military has already had it for quite some time. And so on the surface, it seems as though this technology is military in nature. And so what happens is Batman basically goes to, uh, or, or tells Batwoman, there's a much bigger issue going on here. Whoever has access to this technology is in a position whereby they seem to be operating from the shadows. More so than that, there seems to be a looming threat on the horizon that Batman can't quite figure out on his own, or at the very least, deal with on his own. And so what he's done is he's basically come to Batwoman for the purpose of petitioning her to not really militarize so much as bring together the remnants of the Bat family who are not off doing their own thing, which is to say Nightwing, Batgirl, so on, to basically bring together the ancillary members of the Bat of the Bat family and kind of whip them into shape and turn them into a solid team. Now, again, this aspect of Kathy Kane not really being part of the Bat family uh, comes in the fact that Bruce Wayne reveals his identity to her. Now, his expectation is that she doesn't know who he is, but she had already figured it out. In addition to this, they're actually cousins, for those of you guys who uh, weren't wildly familiar with uh, with Batman's continuity. And so, you know, while the uh, while Martha Wayne was kind of the link between the two of them, this aspect of their relationship, you know, in terms of being siblings, will actually become a pretty significant point uh, over the course of the story. But the fact remains here, that what we get is a sort of tour of the different people who are going to be brought into this team uh, under the training of Batwoman. Now, we don't really need to go into each of them in depth, uh, simply because of the fact that there'll be expansions on their characters later on, but somebody that the story will focus on later on is, uh, is spoiler, is Stephanie Brown. Now, we also learn this team is going to consist of Tim Drake, who is currently operating under the mantle of Red Robin. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, Tim Drake was, of course, Robin. He fought alongside Batman for a time, but much like Dick Grayson, much like Damian Wayne, or what will probably become of Damian Wayne, uh, you know, much like Jason Todd, Tim Drake sort of struck out on his own. Now, Jason Todd's a little bit different of a situation simply because he was killed, but uh, the fact remains here that, you know, Tim Drake struck out on his own, much like Dick Grayson, to become his own hero, Red Robin. And so, while he's still there as part of the Bat family, he doesn't really operate in the same capacity as you would expect to see a Robin fighting alongside uh, Batman. But the fact remains that the, the ties between the two of them are still very close, and in fact, this story will basically say that, uh, that, that Tim Drake is the best of them, that Tim Drake is the most capable of them in terms of its technology. Now, the next of these is a uh, is a character named Orphan. Now, Orphan, again, is not really a Robin. She's really more of a character that was kind of brought in at the behest of, uh, of Bruce Wayne to sort of operate as a Black Ops agent, so to speak, going into places that Batman, that uh, the other Robins simply couldn't access on their own. But nonetheless, the entire basis behind this is that we're seeing a kind of assembly of sorts. Now, an oddball that's actually thrown into this team comes in the form of Clayface. And this is one of the reasons why the detective line of stories uh, seems to be so cool in terms of how it's being brought to us. With the character of Clayface or uh, or Basil Carlo, we would just kind of uh, chalk him up as an incorrigible villain. He's been a longtime foe of Batman, but in this detective line of comics, he's looking for redemption. He's looking to sort of return himself to normalcy. Now, a lot of this is psychological. A lot of this is because of the fact that Clayface just simply doesn't want to be a bad guy anymore. The repetition of fighting Batman, being thrown in Arkham Asylum, escaping and going back in again, uh, it seems to really sort of take away from his desire to live. And so what happens is he's basically, uh, you know, 
in a theater had, had essentially ran everybody out for the purpose of just watching a movie of himself by himself, you know, without being disturbed. And he's greeted by the arrival of both Batman and Batwoman. Now, because of the fact that uh, Clayface is looking for redemption, because of the fact that he's looking to uh, make up for his past misdeeds, Batman and Batwoman offer him this option, but only under the condition that he does what it is that they're told. And so from here, for the next little bit of the story, we get somewhat of a, of a kind of training montage of sorts in the sense that we see Red Robin, we see that Orphan, we see that, that uh, you know, Stephanie Brown, spoiler, that all these forces, you know, all, all these individuals are essentially training. They're learning how to work as a team, but we're also finding that they all have individual weaknesses and their weaknesses that could in effect cause them to end up losing a battle or even losing their lives in the process. Uh, the issue with Stephanie Brown, according to Batwoman, is that, um, you know, she is, she's someone that has all kinds of capable moves, but she never trained her body to practice those moves for the long haul, meaning that she doesn't have stamina that can allow her to, you know, stay fighting using her particular form of fighting for the long haul. Now, this isn't a bad thing simply because she's able to incapacitate, you know, a small number of people in a very short amount of time. But the issue that Batwoman's bringing up is what happens if she has to fight 50 people or 100 people? She won't have the stamina to keep that going. Uh, Orphan is very capable in terms of fighting ability. But the problem with this is that Orphan tries to fight everybody's battles because Orphan is so capable as a fighter. In addition to this, Clayface it really doesn't have any, any fighting fundamentals whatsoever. And this is largely because of the fact that Clayface usually uh, uses his, his malleability to create stabbing weapons, to create daggers, you know, objects that can easily cut through individuals. And so he never really had to learn how to fight. But the question that uh, that Batwoman brings up is what would happen if he did learn how to fight just as good as as her or Spoiler or, uh, or Orphan or Batman? You know, in that instance, Clayface would become a formidable threat if his body hardened automatically in order to prepare for contact for, uh, you know, different punches and things like that. Now, again, this isn't wildly important, uh, important stuff. This is really just us being told as the reader that the two of them were, I guess, that this, this group is kind of fleshing out what it is that makes them weak, fleshing out these things that, uh, that sort of seem to take away from that. Now, from here, we actually end up jumping to uh, to a woman named Leslie Thompson. Now, Leslie Thompson is, of course, again, uh, working, I believe, as part of uh, St. Dumas, but uh, Leslie Thompson is, is more, she's more akin to, like, Night Nurse from Marvel Comics in the sense that she basically uh, helps different superheroes, different people deal with their own injuries. She's closely associated with the Bat family more so than anybody else. It doesn't mean that she doesn't make appearances with other superheroes, but you're more inclined to see her in a Batman comic than you are anywhere else. But the fact remains here that uh, both Bruce Wayne and Tim Drake have traveled here to gain what information they can from Jean-Paul Valley, just because of the fact that his, his travels as an assassin would preview him to information that they simply wouldn't be able to get a hold of on their own. Now, what he says is that there's some organization operating out there called the Colony. They don't really know what the Colony is, or he doesn't really know a whole lot about the Colony. All he knows is that they seem to be operating from the shadows, and they appear to be operating under the auspices of taking Gotham by force. Now, there's something else that I also want to point out, something I want you to take note of, is a conversation that happens between Batman and Tim Drake, and things like this we're going to put a lot of emphasis on in this video, because these are pretty important. But what Batman does is sort of have a heart-to-heart uh, -heart discussion, or at least as close of a heart-to-heart -heart discussion as uh, Bruce Wayne can have with Tim Drake. And what he says is that Tim is extremely capable. Tim has uh, has always kind of carved out a niche for himself. You know, he's able to hold his own in a multitude of different ways. But Tim Drake always sort of wanted to move away from being Batman because he didn't want to end up like Bruce Wayne. But more so than that, what, what Bruce says is that there's always a place for him to come back if he wants to. That the city of Gotham is safer if uh, if Red Robin is operating, if Tim Drake is operating within the city. Now, this is a huge amount of respect from Batman because what he's basically saying is that Tim Drake is every bit as good as he is. And there's truth to this. You know, Tim Drake is every bit as capable as Batman. Sure, Batman has more money. He's got a little more experience. And if the two of them fought against one another, Batman would probably win with a little bit of an edge, but it doesn't mean that he would walk all over Tim Drake. Tim Drake would put up one hell of a fight. But the fact remains here that Tim Drake also has a relationship going on with Stephanie Brown. And this is really cool because it gives us a little more meat and potatoes to things that are going on. It shows us that not all of these members of this uh, extended Bat family are just operating side by side without any real connection. Instead, they have a romantic relationship. They are very much in love with one another. Now, from here, we pick up with Bruce Wayne as he's making his way back to the Batcave. But before he can arrive, he's actually set upon by what appear to be some enemy forces, most likely these individuals belonging to the colony. And so while they taunt him, while they initially say that they'll take him out, Batman seems to be the kind of hero who would get the upper hand. He would most likely be able to hold his own here. But once everything seems to come to an end, and once the rest of the Bat family begin to analyze the situation, they also come to the realization that Batman seems to have been completely incapacitated by these forces of the colony. They seem to be trained in military tactics. They have access to advanced technology. They are, for all intents and purposes, or seem, for all intents and purposes, to have been designed to be equal 
equal to Batman, if not superior to Batman. And so again, this is really just more of an analysis on behalf of these extended Bat member families. And so with Tim Drake and Batwoman analyzing this situation and realizing that if Bruce Wayne was taken out, that this is a very serious force, they basically begin calling together the various members. We see them calling together uh, Orphan, they bring together uh, Clayface, they bring in Stephanie Brown. It's, it's really kind of an all hands on deck sort of situation. In addition to this, what Batwoman also does is she calls her father. Now, this is done by her because of the fact that these guys have military training. And so even if her father doesn't know exactly where these guys came from, what he would know is what kind of tactics they're using or what kind of technology they have and perhaps give them information on that technology. The problem with this is that it's actually revealed that her father is the one behind all of this, that her father is the one that's actually leading the colony with intentions that weren't initially explained to us. Now, these intentions are actually given to us later on, and what he says here is that for him, Batman represents fear. Batman represents motivation for criminals to not break the law. Now, it doesn't mean that Batman's an absolute truth. It doesn't mean that all criminals will avidly avoid Batman. What it does mean is that he's extremely capable in terms of his uh, martial arts training, his tactics, and his, uh, his stealth uh, subterfuge, and so on and so forth everything that makes him who he is and so because batman had been taken prisoner by the colony they actually began breaking down his utility belt and analyzing everything inside of it which again gives them some very significant uh benefits in terms of what their goal is and what we're told is that the goal of the colony is to actually use batman's technology to use his role in gotham on a much larger scale that instead of simply fighting criminals and then sending them away that instead they want to basically eliminate criminals in their entirety now again this this does not explain why it is that uh, Colonel Kane or why it is that, that Kathy Kane's father is implementing this in the first place. And it's never truly explained to us in this story. It may simply be that he's being pulled, or I guess the strings of his actions are being pulled by somebody else, or it may never be explained. Uh, but because DC Rebirth is so tight on continuity, it would make sense that we would get an explanation at some future point in time. And so what happens is that Bat while Batman is able to escape his prison, while he is able to uh, to move away and begin able to, uh, I guess, take out these various, uh, these various forces, in the end, once he once he confronts Colonel Kane, you know, once they begin having this conversation about being an heir to the League of Shadows, Batwoman basically shows up along with the rest of the extended Bat family and do everything they can to begin fighting these forces off. Now, this is when the death of Tim Drake begins to come into play here. While these forces are able to fight off, you know, the colony, while, while you know, the extended Bat family is able to hold their own within reason, the issue here is that the colony has begun plans to basically begin taking out various people people, most notably the Bat family. Now, it doesn't mean kill them. It simply means incapacitate them so that they won't be part of a part of a bigger issue. More so than that, Colonel Kane has kind of reached this level of insanity where he's basically adopted this mindset where they have to raise the city of Gotham in order to rebuild it, which is to say tear it down and create something better. And so because of this, Tim Drake goes through and actually reprograms the drones in order to not target anybody else and to target him directly. The problem with this is that it seems to inevitably result in the death of Tim Drake. Now, something that I like you to take note of here and this is something that i actually didn't realize until one of you guys had posted a comment down in the uh, comment section in my video on action comics in that series when we had talked about who was clark kent we had mentioned that there was a man who was wearing a plaid shirt who had a hat who had a beard but we didn't know who he was he was very mysterious and we didn't know what was going on with him this man actually appears here and he seems to be watching all these events that are unfolding all these events that are taking place now again this is just kind of a nod this is just kind of a uh, of a small indication that there may be a much bigger picture taking place Place. But in the end, uh, this is really all just a situation whereby the target is Gotham City and the goal of the Bat family is to basically save Gotham. And so what they do, or at least what Batman does, is he recalls the extended members of the Bat family, brings them all back to uh, to his location in order to ensure that all of them will remain safe from, uh, from these drones and can plan accordingly. The issue with this is that because Tim Drake had reprogrammed the drones, he made himself the sole target. And so he is inevitably going to die in this. Now, this is actually a beautiful moment as it's written here in Detective Comics. And this is why I love this story so much. This is Tim Drake giving his last goodbyes. This is Tim Drake telling Batman that it was an honor to fight beside him, it, that he always loved being Robin, that if anybody needs to live here, it needs to be Batman, simply because of the fact that Batman is so wildly intelligent, that Batman is so capable. But more so than that, he sends his love, basically, to Stephanie Brown, telling her that while he had somewhat of a uh, of a rough experience growing up, while he had somewhat of a very rough 
childhood, while Batman was able to give him a place, give him a direction to go to in order to carve out his own niche in the world, in the end, he was still very much alone. Stephanie Brown had basically given him a reason to keep going, that her love for him showed the kind of life that he could lead. And so saying his last goodbyes to her is not something that she wants to hear, but in the end, before she can respond, before she can get him to more or less come to senses, Tim Drake severs communications between the two of them and is essentially attacked by the drones who again have sought after him and killed him as their target, or at least it's believed that they had killed him as their target. Now, to the rest of the Bat family, to Batman, to, to Clayface, to, you know, to Alfred, to Duke Thomas, to Stephanie Brown, you know, even Nightwing and, and everybody who was listening on, Tim Drake was believed to have been dead. He was believed to have been killed off. But what we actually learn here is that this is not the case. Instead, Tim Drake seems to have been whisked away by some individual that we're not sure who this person is. Now, this is not the first time we've seen this guy. This guy actually appeared in Action Comics when he was watching the events unfold in the fight between the pre-New 52 Superman and the pre-New 52 Doomsday. Then this unknown person kept saying things about how a human Clark Kent shouldn't exist, that Doomsday should not exist in the New 52. The pre-New 52 Superman should not exist in the New 52. And so this person seems to have this idea that they're effectively going to create or I guess fix the uh, fix the timeline or they're going to do something to adjust it. We don't really know what direction it is that DC is going with this. But what we do know is that this person seems to serve as one part of a much bigger picture. He seems to serve as one one part of a much larger situation that will likely come with the first, I guess, the, the, the huge line wide crossover that DC has, presumably following the events of uh, Justice League versus Suicide Squad. But with that being said, let me know what you guys think about uh, about Detective Comics because in my mind, this story is beautifully written. It's it's one of the absolute best stories that, that I've seen so far. And uh, I think this is a real testament to how well DC Rebirth is being done by DC Comics, to how well they're, uh, they're really taking these continuities, you know, from the pre-New 52 and the New 52, combining them together and taking us on one hell of a ride when it comes to storytelling. But with that being said, uh, if you guys are new here, hit, a, hit the like button, uh, hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps, and leave a comment below. Let me know what you guys think. And I will catch you guys later. Peace.